Okay. Okay, we're recording now. Okay, let's be nice. <laughs> okay, so uh, the uh, the lesson for today, the base rule would be the last topic before our uh, long test, the first long test. Okay, so that means that uh, this time uh, I would. Okay, uh, this time uh, around this time next week will be your laboratory and then i will continue on with uh, with a new topic next meeting but tentatively we'll see that your examination will be sometime in uh, your test will be sometime let's see calendar okay let's just maybe let's just schedule it because I want you to have the lab first so that you can have an exercise because you don't. Okay, I won't say anything. Okay, uh, now uh, you have the lab. I mean, uh, the, the first lab, I mean, decision tree was already uh, submitted uh, last Thursday and the new lab, the last lab for decision tree was already given yesterday. And so the deadline for that will be next week. So today we'll have the last topic so the net, that means next week we will have uh, your lab session. That means that the following week I will continue with a new topic because I still want you to work on that laboratory exercise. So that means that uh, your, your first long test will be on, so that means uh, the 30th was the last, yeah, 30 years is the last one. And the, 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 new, the new topic I will discuss. And so what I want to do is that I want to make uh, the lab session as our examination time. I mean, the, the long test time. So that means that you'll, I will give you the lab on the 29th, the new lab for base rule. And then the deadline will be, oh, the deadline will be on that, on the five. And can I give you that long test also on that five? Okay, the deadline for the, because I want you to do the work on it as part of your exercise. So the deadline will be for the lab will be just before the, the long test one. Okay, so that means that we will see each other on, on the fifth, please write down. On the fifth, we will see each other in the physics lab for the long test one, physics lab okay so if you have been uh, physics lab uh, long, uh, the physics lab our laboratory time starting at 12 o'clock yes and so we do 12 o'clock so you might uh, need uh, two hours or three hours it's up to you so I just put uh, two hours but I don't think uh, three hours is uh, is necessary, maybe two and a half hours. I'll just put it uh, two and a half hours. Okay, so it's there. That will be your long test one. Long test one. Okay, so that means that today uh, we'll have our last uh, our last lecture for the long test, and then another lecture on the thirtieth next week, and then the following week will be long, long test one. Okay. That means on the next week, on, on the next day, I will discuss. I will continue discussing new lessons so that we can catch up. I mean, in the with the time we can finish early, then that's better, so that you can uh, spend time. I, I guess we will finish early because there's no disruption or in our class schedule compared to other classes. Okay, so now let's continue. Uh, so that's set already. Please uh, tell your friends who are not around and also make announcements in the where is. Where is my TA? I'm here, sir. Ah, good length. It's on four. Okay. Yeah. Why Why didn't you use my camera? I'm using it. I just didn't enable the video. Okay. So let me see. Okay. Now let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, this today we're going to discuss about base rule. 
And uh, this is the, the fourth lecture. Okay, just to recap on what we did before. Okay, in all our lectures, what we are looking at are looking at functions. We're going to solve functions. Who's that? Can you explain? Yes, sir. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Uh, we are going to need uh, the, the output Y. In, in our case, it will be the, uh, the, the, the output uh, in, in the linear regression, the output that is closest, I mean, the, the Y estimate that is closest to the actual data output, okay? So the question there in the linear regression was, what kind of function can we, uh, what kind of polynomial function can we derive uh, what are the weights of those polynomial functions in particular that will give us the best estimate of a given data such that if this was your estimate of the data, then the error between the given data and your function estimate is minimal. Okay, that's for polynomial regression. For decision tree, again, we are looking at a function. In this case, uh, a decision function that will give us uh, inputs of again, there's the table of, of data. For example, do you want to play tennis or not? So we want to have inputs and then we want to solve the function that will give us the decision of given these inputs, for example, there's a wind, the outlook now is overcast and it's, uh, or it's overcast, yes, you will play tennis. When it rains, then you have to consider wind and all these other things, would you play tennis or not, okay? So again, we are looking at the function and this function is a tree in a form of a tree, in a form of a decision tree that will help us make a decision of whether to play tennis or not, okay? So in all cases that we are doing here, we are looking at functions, solving for functions, giving inputs, that function will take in the input and then we will output on whether we want uh, certain decisions or we want the, the, the error estimates for decision for decision tree, error estimate, the least error estimate for linear regression, and in this case, the Bayes rule, okay? Now, we want to solve a function in a Bayes rule that will give us, again, a decision of probability in this case, a probability of a particular decision, okay? So let's, let's look at first uh, the Bayes rule. Bayes rule, I'm just uh, showing this one so that you can have an idea on what it looks like. So given Y, Y is again the output, whether yes or no, the probability, P is probability. Probability of a Y output given X. X are the attributes, okay? So again, for example, it, it, we were looking at, uh, uh, in the decision tree given, uh, I didn't put the, the relative uh, equation here. I mean, the, the, the uh, what was that dependent uh, entropy. So anyway, in the entropy, okay, maybe I'll, I'll bring it up so that we can have a comparison. It doesn't take long. So here is the decision tree, this one, okay. Okay, I will give the equation for the entropy. Here, okay, the big equation for the entropy. So in this case here, you are given an attribute X, okay? So you are given an attribute X, a decision of whether true or false, Given a decision, uh, given an attribute x, in this case, for example, x one. There are two attributes, x one and x two, and so these are the these are the entropy, the, the computation of the entropy. These are also probabilities, but the the whole thing is a is a conditional entropy. Given an out, I mean, the entropy, the conditional entropy of a y output given an x attribute. So the same thing here in the Bayes rule. This is a probability probability of the Y output given an attribute X. So now we will compute the probability. So of course there are many outputs, many possible outputs and many possible attributes, okay? Then we will choose which of those probabilities, which of those outputs given a certain attribute will give us the highest probability, okay? Or if you want the lowest probability, you, you want the least occurrence, then it's up, it's up to you to decide, okay? 
So in this case here in the Bayes rule, we're looking at uh, probabilities that will help us decide. They're looking at the function of the probability of an output of an output y given a particular attribute x. So how it is computed? Because this is unknown. Okay, here or sometimes this is known and some uh, it depends. Yeah. So some of the terms are known and some of the things are unknown. So we will solve for the unknown things that uh, some information that are uh, useful to us. Okay. Usually the useful information is not known to us. Yeah. Those information that are to us are normally used to, to compute for the unknown information that we want to, to know. So in this case here, so given it, there's a probability, so this uh, probability of out an output Y given a particular attribute X is equal to probability that of that attribute given the Y output, a particular Y output multiplied by the probability of the Y divided by probability of the attribute. Okay, so let's just uh, familiarize ourselves later. I will discuss with you in more detail. But for now, let's just familiarize ourselves. That in this particular case, it can be uh, very specific. So very specific to an output Y, an output YI, that is a probability of a no, for example, a given an attribute, or in this case, we're looking at this example, probability of a true, for example, given an attribute X1, okay? So we have to solve attribute uh, y output, uh, no, our the false output given an attribute x1, okay, and then x1 given a y output, a given that y is a no, yeah, x1 given y is a no, that's that one, and probability of the y, that one we know already, the probability of the y, I mean probability of the y a particular no, that means that in this case particular y that is a no. And in this case here, no divided by how many? One, and this is a false. One divided by one, two, three, four, five, six. That's one over six divided by probability of the X given uh, uh, X one, yeah? So, or equivalently we can, because normally this is, uh, this is uh, if there's a particular case, but then in the most cases, we are using an equation that is summation, the, 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 the deriv I mean, the denominator is using the summation of all the probabilities of all the possible attributes. In this case here, the K is the index of all the, uh, of all the, possible, uh, of all the possible outputs, yeah? Given the possible, this particular attributes of all the possible outputs. So in this case here, if this is given, you can use it, but if y, if the attribute is given with respect to a particular output, then you use the, uh, the equation below, okay? So in this case here, you have, you know, the, the, the numerator, the x attribute in this case, x1, because the j is constant, and then the y is a no. In this case here, y, k, so that means you take all the possible uh, outputs. So you take this when y is a no, and again, you take this when y is a, is a yes, and you take this, maybe there are some other cases. In this case, true or false. So there are only two cases: probability of the false and probability of a true. Okay. So depending on what is given, you can use the equation above or you can use the equation below. Okay. Let's continue. I just want to show that uh, the, the, there's a relationship. I mean, there's the uh, the continuity of the of the concept of probabilities of the dependent probabilities or conditional probabilities in the previous example in the previous lecture. Okay. So now let's continue. Presentation. So next. So let's go for an example. So first example uh, is for us to understand better. So an example of a base rule. So there are three jars containing colored balls. Okay. So red, white, and blue uh, blue jars. Okay. Or no. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the jars, there are, there are three jars, jars one, two, and three, and the balls that are colored red, white, and blue, okay? So now, one jar is chosen at random, so whether you choose jar one, jar two, or jar three, okay? So you usually randomly choose a, a, a jar, so given one jar, yeah? And then a ball is selected, so you choose the ball in the jar, so these are the number of uh, colored balls inside a jar. For example, in jar three, there are four red balls, three white balls, and two blue balls, okay? 
and then in jar two, there's one red ball, red ball, and uh, two white balls, and three blue balls, and so on. Yeah. And so the question is, if you choose randomly a jar, okay, and also select a ball, of course, randomly inside the jar. If the ball is red, okay, what is the probability that it came from the second jar? Okay. So now the question is that given that the ball is red, and then what is the probability that it came from the second jar? Probability, that means probability of second jar given that the ball is red. Okay, we can use the base rule on that. Okay, so first let us compose the, the equation. Okay, I mean, let us understand the problem and compose the equation. So now we will define the following events. J1 is an event of the first jar is chosen because now we are going to choose uh, jars, yeah? So J2, second jar is chosen, J3 is uh, third jar is chosen, and R is the event that the red ball is uh, chosen, and W is a white ball is chosen, and B is blue ball is chosen. You can also include that, okay? Then in the, in the events that uh, J1, J2, and J3 are chosen, they are mutually exclusive. What does mutually exclusive mean? That means you cannot choose, when you choose one, it's really jar one. You cannot choose, there are no, there, you cannot choose them at the same time or there are, no, uh, there are no overlap between your choices. So mutually exclusive is statistical term to describing, to describe uh, two or more events that cannot occur simultaneously. So it is just, sing, there's no, it is by itself an independent event, okay? So each, each event is independent and you cannot choose two different jars at the same time, okay? So that is given. So you can only choose one jar. And because of that, this, our sample space has been divided or partitioned along these three events. So now we, this sample space is divided. So in the event diagram, so this is the event of the jar one, event of jar two, and event of jar three, okay? So they don't overlap. So. The probability, this is the entire event, okay? We're just uh, writing the probability. If you choose jar one, that is, uh, I'm just looking at each one of you that you are there. Where is this loop? Okay. So this is the probability of jar one being chosen, probability jar two. So each one of them have equal probabilities of being chosen because there are three, possible choices, though each one of them has a one-third probability, okay? I think this is, uh, this is well understood, okay? So all of the red balls are given in the first, second, and third, okay? So there's overlap, okay? So now this is the space of all the red balls where some red balls are in jar two, some red balls are in jar one, and some red balls are in jar three, okay? So this space here in the Venn diagram is where the red ball space intersects with jar one. So that means that red ball is in jar one, okay? This again, this space here is that the red ball intersects with jar two. That means that red ball is inside jar two. And then again here, that red ball is inside jar three, okay? So now these are all the RC, I think this is the red ball. This is all the other, what is this one? The intersection of red, uh, it should be the rest of the other balls because the red balls are in here. Okay, let's assume that this is the intersection of the rest of the other balls, okay? Because this is the space of the red balls, okay? The space of the other balls and then this space, the intersection of the other balls with respect to J2, of course they don't overlap because again, there's no overlapping of red balls and the blue balls and the white balls because the, all of them are independent, okay? So let's concentrate on the space where each jar uh, intersects with the red ball. That means the red balls that are inside the, each of the individual jars, okay? So now we, we, look, we are looking at uh, finding the probabilities because we are looking at the probability of the, the of, a, of jar two that is chosen from the jar two given that the ball is red, okay? So what is the probability for each sample space and how do we, uh, how do we find them? So the intersection, okay? The intersection of two events A and B can be written as probability of this one, yeah? 
I mean, so probability of the intersection of A and B. So for example, here, probability of J2 and uh, R intersection can be written as, in this case, the, in this case, the, the, uh, how do you, how do we call it this now? Conditional probability. So conditional uh, probability that probability of A that given B and multiplied by probability of B. So all we need to do is just re re replace this, uh, this event with this conditional probability, okay? So for example, we compute the probabilities. Probability that uh, J1, uh, that the red ball is in J1, okay? Okay, then we say that probability that the ball is red given that it's in jar one and probability of jar one, okay? Then we can compute this probability. So why is this like this, okay? Probability of that the that the okay, let's start from here. Okay, probability of jar one we know this. That's one third. Okay, we understand that. And then what is the probability that the jar, I mean that the ball is red given it is in jar one? Three over eight. Okay, why is it three over eight? Let's go back. Given that is in jar one, okay? The probability the ball is red. So given in jar one, we look at this one, where's the data? Okay, given that is in jar one, what is the prob probability that it is red? So this is all jar one. That's what we are given, okay? So let's concentrate on jar one that it is red. So three divided by how, my, how many? Eight, okay? The total number of balls is eight. So that's three over eight. Okay, so now uh, this one, we know this, how this one was taken, and we know this, how this one is taken or computed. Now the result is, now this is the probability that the intersection, that the red, that the, the ball, uh, that the jar randomly chosen, I mean, the, that the red ball is in jar one, okay? So this is that uh, space, uh, the intersection of uh, red ball and jar one. So similar calculations we can do. So probability of jar two and jar three, that's all one third. And again, probability of red given jar two. So let's go back there. Probability of red given jar two, given jar two. So this one probability of red is one divided by six. So it should be one divided by six, one divided by six and so on. So the same thing given that the, given that the jar three and probability and red, jar three and red, so that's four divided by, what is this seven, eight, nine. So four over nine. So four over nine times one, third, and so on, okay? So now with this calculation, we were able to find all these probabilities. The probability that the red is a given jar one, probability of red in, in jar one, and probability of red in jar two, and probability of red in jar three, okay? Okay, now, uh, uh, I mean, the event that the, the jar, the uh, jar two event, that the jar two is chosen and then that your, the red ball is, uh, is uh, chosen, okay? So, I, uh, 10 more minutes. So now these are all the uh, computations of all the probabilities, okay? So the intersection of the events that the, okay, again, which is not very clear, the intersection of the events the intersection that the ball is red event and the intersection of the that the jar uh, two is uh, chosen so with this probability the jar two is chosen and the ball is red these are all the probabilities okay of those uh, two intersections so now we update the venn diagram and then we we put all these values and then these are this is the space of this intersection of jar one with respect to R, space of jar two with respect to R and the space of jar three with respect to R. Okay, so now we can compute. So there are, uh, we, there are ways of, of expressing uh, Bayes rule. There are many ways of expressing Bayes rule. So this is one form where we discuss about the other form before. So we can write it down. Uh, maybe I should uh, annotate. Okay, so in this case here, we can write uh, 
probability that was given to us of R given a jar two probability of jar two. Okay. Uh, that's what we say that the event, the intersection of these two events can be cho can be uh, the intersection of the event that the run jar two is chosen randomly and that uh, R is uh, the red ball is chosen and these two events intersecting can be written in this form. Okay, and then the proper total probability that the ball is red. Okay, we can also express this one if we if we cannot. Remember that the, the balls are not, uh, they are not, uh, they are not together. They're not in the same container. So the balls, the red balls, they are, they have, you have to consider them. In this case, we cannot consider it as a one case of probability because some of the red balls and in the, in the other jars. So now we need to consider the probability of the red ball with the assumption, I mean, with the condition that some, some balls are in the other jars, in jar one, jar two, and jar three. So then now this one we have to compute. Okay, so now, the, now this is what, uh, okay, we have to erase this. Now this part here is chosen, I mean, this one is already, we already mentioned that, we can write this one as probabilities. Now, as I mentioned, this one, probability of the red ball, there are many intersections. I mean, there are many events of this one. That means that the red ball intersecting with jar one, okay, plus the probability of red ball intersecting with jar two and plus uh, red ball intersecting with jar three. Because in this case here, we don't have a single event of a red ball, but the red ball is uh, contained or in the space of a, in the space of each of those jars. So now we have to rewrite this one. So that means now this one is written as this one already. So now, because we are not familiar with how we express this one, what we are familiar with is the, is the conditional probability. So we can write it with the equations that we are familiar with, okay, for us to be, uh, to make our lives easier. So we have probability of R given J1 times probability of J1. Okay, then probability of R given J2, you see? Now, because you have to do this because again, the, uh, the red ball is not uh, totally independent. It is dependent on where it is placed, okay? So the red ball, probability of the red ball, in this case, in jar three, Okay, but the probability of each of the jars, they're all independent. That's why you can write this one, probability of J3, okay? There's no overlap in this one, okay? So we can express J3 very easily, okay? So in a way, we found a way we got to, on how to express the, uh, the intersection of two independent events, in this case, J2 and R, so that you know, we express it in the form of a conditional probability, okay? And in this case, the total probability of a ball of, of an event that is not totally dependent, but are, are dependent on where they, they occur, in this case, where they are placed. And so the, the total probability can be computed using these equations below, okay? So yeah, this, uh, this uh, equation is a different form of, uh, I mean, equivalent form. It's the same, the same base rule but there is just expressing using different terms. So sometimes if you're given this one probability of red immediately, we don't need to go through the other expressions because they're already given to us, okay? So depending on what is given, we can use it. But what we really want to know is that this, this problem here, what is the probability that the a red ball is chosen and that it came from jar two, okay? Okay. Given that there was a red ball, what is the probability that it was taken from jar two? Okay, by by just uh, thinking, it is quite difficult to to really you know to logically 
I see what's going on. But if you just look at the equations, then you can you can compute and say convince yourself that uh, yeah, this is the this is the correct computation of this occurrence. Okay. So now let's clear, clear all the drawings and we continue. Okay. There will be ten more minutes and then I will uh, uh, ten more minutes remaining for the class. I mean for the Zoom and then I'll invite you again. Okay. Uh, I will. It will be the same. The same. Uh, meeting room okay so now we have uh, we have expressed uh, this one okay so this is a different form of expression in the Bayes rule that is not on the conditional probability but on the intersection of two independent events okay so in this case j1 and r event i mean j2 and r event j1 and r event j2 and r event and j3 and r event okay so if you are given this information we have already computed this before. Now, this is the probability that the, 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 the red ball that was chosen was from JAR2. Okay, how does this uh, numerically, how does it, uh, it give us, what, what kind of information it gives us? Okay, there are many other probabilities, of course. Okay, in the total probabilities will be one. Okay, there are uh, the drawing of a white ball, given white ball and probability of J2 that is taken from J2, given that the blue ball was drawn and its probability is J2. And then the same thing, jar, I mean, the red was cho uh, chosen and the probability is from jar, jar three or jar one like that, yeah? So all these other probabilities will sum up into one event, okay? Probability of equal to one. Okay, now another example. Uh, can somebody read this? Okay, you can read. Mr. Boaho, can you read it? Okay, all tractors made by a company are produced on one of three assembly lines. Okay. Names red, nice white, blue. You know, it will be focused in the in the camera, in the video. Sir? Read nicely because uh, you will be focused in the video. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> all tractors made by a company are produced on one of three assembly lines. Named red, white, blue. Uh, the chances that a tractor will not start when it rolls off on a line are 6%, six, 11%, six and 8% of lines red, white, blue, respectively. 48% oh. of the company's tractors are made in the red line, and 31 are made on the blue line. What fraction of the company's tractors, tractors do not start when they roll off an assembly line? Okay. So what are we looking at? What is the problem? I mean, in general, what's the problem in general? What are we looking at? It is about, it's a manufacturing company and what? They manufacture 